Well, comrades, it's, it's, it's really awesome to be back here in Montreal. To be with literally hundreds of revolutionary communists. And I'm sure that, like me, all of you have been affected by what's been going on in Gaza. This wholesale slaughter of tens of thousands of, of, of Gazans, mainly women and children. It evokes nausea, disgust, outrage. Especially when you compare this to, to what they say about Ukraine. And all of this combined has really shaken people's consciousness. And it's really accelerated that process of transformation. <laughs> now as Trotsky wrote on the eve of World War II, every profound crisis whether economic, political, or military, has its positive side, and that it puts to test all the various traditional values and formulas, laying bare the rottenness of those that serve to mask peacetime contradictions, and thereby spurring forward the general development. <laughs> but of course, it's not enough to be outraged. As Spinoza once said famously, <laughs> I have striven not to laugh at human actions, not to weep at them, nor to hate them, but to understand them. Now, if we're going to get organized to defeat our class enemy, we have to understand it. Especially when that enemy dominates the entire planet. It has trillions of dollars at its disposal. It's armed to the teeth with the most advanced weaponry. including enough nuclear weapons to destroy humanity and all other biological organisms 55 times over. <laughs> and that might sound scary. But we should never forget that the working class is a far more powerful force and that against the, the power of the workers, all the armaments, the surveillance, repression, and propaganda are actually a sign of weakness, not of strength. They're absolutely terrified of the unstoppable power of the organized and unified working class once it moves into action. <coughs> Which is why they do everything possible to divide us and turn us against each other. <clears throat> but that game won't last forever. And already millions of people are drawing very advanced conclusions based on their experience of life under this murderous and inhumane system. And if we're going to help those millions realize fully revolutionary conclusions, communist conclusions, then we need to be armed with Marxist theory and a dialectical understanding of history. Because those are our guides to efficient and effective action. Now, for a brief uh, historical period, we were told that war was an abnormality, that it was a disruption. It was a disruption of nice, peaceful capitalism. But the truth is, if you look around the world, 
that wars of mass devastation and displacement are not a thing of the past. This new normality of crisis and war is really the old capitalist normality taken to the next level. What was abnormal was that relative pause in imperialist violence. <laughs> But let's not forget that during that pause, since World War II, we saw major wars in Korea and Vietnam, in Iraq, in Iran, in Afghanistan, <laughs> not, to mention, not to mention wars in the Democratic Republic of Congo, In, in Darfur, Syria, Lebanon, I mean Libya, sorry, oh, and Lebanon, Ukraine, and now Gaza. We're living in a world on fire. There are at least 110 armed conflicts going on right now around the world. And total global military expenditure has reached a new high. $2.24 trillion U.S. dollars. <coughs> Now, the prospect of an all-out world war is very unlikely in the next period. And that's due in part to the deterrent effect of nuclear weapons. but above all because of the class balance of forces which is overwhelmingly in favor of the working class. But even small wars are disastrous to the people that are caught up in them. As the American Civil War General William Sherman once said, war is hell. War is cruelty, and you cannot refine it. But Lenin once said that war is not only terrible, it's terribly profitable. <coughs> and war can mean huge profits for the capitalists. But those wars are also risky, because they exacerbate all the contradictions of peacetime. They test all leaders, all parties, all tendencies and ideas. As Lenin said, war equals the greatest possible crisis. Although there's the possibility of temporary retardation and regress, every crisis means acceleration of development sharpening of contradictions, their exposure, and the collapse of all that is rotten. Which is why we sometimes say that war is the handmaiden of revolution. We saw this in the aftermath of both world wars. So whether we like it or not, we live in an age of crisis, of war, revolution, and counter-revolution. <laughs> and our analysis has to start from this basic fact. We have to understand that you cannot have capitalism without war. As uh, uh, Karl von Clausewitz uh, once put it, war is the continuation of politics by other means. And as Lenin explained, politics is a concentrated expression of economics. So foreign policy is an extension of domestic policy. And under capitalism, that means the, the pursuit of maximum profits by any means necessary. <coughs> So communists have to have the same attitude. 
our program in times of war is the same essentially as our program in times of peace. We're for class struggle, class independence, and the revolutionary overthrow of the existing order through the, the united action of the organized and mobilized working class, both at home and abroad. So just as we're against imperialist war, we're also against imperialist peace. Right now, within Canada, you're at peace. But we know, obviously, that the class war is still raging. So it flows from this that we're not pacifists as communists. We're not against all wars in the abstract. As with any other question, we have to analyze things concretely. And we always start from a class position, a, a class analysis, and, and this basic rule of thumb. And it's basically this. D does this particular convergence of factors or, or conflict or confrontation, does that increase working class consciousness, confidence, and unity? Or does it work against it? Now, it's not always a no-brainer to work that out. There can be different cross-currents. But if you stick to the principle of class independence, you won't go too far wrong. So with that in mind, it should be evident that communists are not obliged to take sides when you have a war between two imperialist camps or their proxies. <laughs> Take the Ukraine war, for example. When it started, pretty much everyone on the left scrambled to pick a side. And they justified their position by cobbling together some kind of an argument. Some of them even used quotes from Lenin himself, taken completely out of context, to prove that they were right to back either uh, American or Russian imperialism. Now, we take the principled class-based stance on, on the line that the main enemy of the working class is at home. We have no trust whatsoever in, in NATO or in the Western imperialists. As for Putin and, and his gang of reactionaries in Russia, the task of overthrowing them is up to the Russian working class. Not NATO. The task of revolutionaries in the West is to fight against our own bourgeoisie, against our own imperialisms, which are the most reactionary force on this planet. But there are times when we do take sides. For example, in, in wars of national liberation against colonial invaders or overlords. Take Gaza, which is being pulverized by a nuclear-armed regional imperialist power, backed fully by the biggest imperialist power in the world. They call this a proportional response to October 7th. But look, in, in every war, there's killing, there's atrocities. Uh, I don't think they should be surprised that this is the case. And so for us, it doesn't matter who struck the first blow. Again, our position is very simple. We will always take the side of the poor and the oppressed against the rich and the powerful. 
Uh, as we discussed last night, anybody, and we discussed this morning as well, anybody who, who uh, is in solidarity with Palestine is, is uh, accused of uh, being a supporter of Hamas. Of supporting terrorism and so on. But we've never supported Hamas. We have our own ideas, our own program, our own methods. We base ourselves on, the, on, on mass action of the working class. On strikes and general strikes. Occupations, workplace occupations, uprisings, and ultimately revolution. That's what Intifada means to us. But of course, we also know that October 7th didn't come from a clear blue sky. The October 7th didn't come out of nowhere. It's the product of a very long and painful history going back even before the Nakba. Capitalism has been around not forever, but in some form or another for a few hundred years. And as Lenin put it, capitalist society is and has always been horror without end. And Gaza is just the latest example of that. Now, this is a, a Marxist school. We can't be satisfied with, with uh, simple slogans or a superficial analysis. So I think we need to go really to the fundamentals of history and theory. And of course, the foundations uh, for understanding war from a class perspective were established by Marx and Engels. And Trotsky also had a very profound understanding of this question. Not only did he provide an incredible analysis of all the wars that he witnessed in his lifetime, but he built the freaking you know, Red Army from scratch and defeated nearly two dozen armies of counter-revolution. But as with so many other aspects of Marxism, it was Lenin who really pulled together the threads uh, first established by, by Marx and Engels. To provide us with a, a comprehensive synthesis and understanding of war in the epoch of imperialism. And in, in doing that, he, he succeeded in orienting and stealing his comrades at a time of unprecedented betrayal and confusion. As I'm sure you know, when World War I started, the entire Second International had collapsed. Almost all of its parties had betrayed their commitment to internationalism. and anti-militarism. In 1912, uh, the socialist parties of the world had held the Basel Congress. And they had agreed to the following. In case war should break out, it is our duty to intervene in favor of its speedy termination and with all our powers to utilize the economic and political crisis created by the war to arouse the people and thereby to hasten the downfall of capitalist rule. Instead, just two years later, they bent over backwards to justify the, and to support their own bourgeoisie. 
they became apologists for the bourgeois and for this imperialist slaughter of, of millions of workers and peasants in uniform. <laughs> As Lenin said, instead of revolutionary tactics, the majority of the social democratic parties conducted reactionary tactics and went, and went over to the side of their respective governments and bourgeoisie. So it was up to Lenin to cut through the fog of war, to go back to basics, and to rearm the caters of the party. And there's a ton we can learn from that experience. But of course, there's a lot more to imperialism than just war. That's only one manifestation of it. And it's not necessarily the most important one. So before going deeper into uh, Lenin's approach to war, I'd like to give the, the big picture overview of his understanding of imperialism more generally. <laughs> Since his understanding of war ultimately flows from that. Now how many of you have read uh, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism? Awesome. How many of you not? Okay, we got some great reading ahead, but I'll give you a little preview. Uh, in the, sorry. <laughs> now, when this book was written in 1916, and Lenin used facts, figures, and arguments to uh, explain what he calls capitalist imperialism, to differentiate it from the imperialism of societies in the ancient world, like, like the Roman Empire. <laughs> but before getting into this overview, let's just take a quick look at Lenin's method, which as we discussed this morning was superb, and, and, and something we need to emulate. Whenever we're confronted with a, with a, a, a thorny problem, we can ask ourselves, what would Lenin do? Uh, because on, on any question that he was examining, whether it was the state, or imperialism, war, ultra-leftism, philosophy, he has this incredible way of systematically breaking a subject down into its component parts, then meticulously analyzing everything from every angle, and then synthesizing and recapitulating everything on an on a even higher level, while ruthlessly exposing the shortcomings of his political opponents. You know, he methodically applies dialectics to every historical, theoretical, and practical problem. <laughs> Always through the lens of the working class, of the class struggle, and always with the aim of clarifying and, and raising the political level of his comrades. So in the case of imperialism, he lays down the principal stages of the emergence of monopoly capitalism in, in, the, in the following manner. Now between 1840 and 1870, you had the apex of the development of free competition. And monopolies were in a very embryonic stage. After the economic crisis of 1873, which was triggered by a collapse in banking and was known as the Long Depression, there was a long period of, of relative uh, upturn in the economy. <coughs> and you had the development of economic trusts and cartels. 
But they were still the exception. In 1900, you had the panic of 1900 to 1903. And by the time the dust had settled, uh, a, a much smaller handful of capitalists had consolidated a lot more wealth and power into their hands. <laughs> and monopolies had become one of the, the foundations of economic life. So the 20th century marks the turning point from the old capitalism to the, to the new. From the domination of capital in general to the, to the domination of finance capital. Capitalism has been transformed into imperialism. And although he warns about, uh, about you know, definitions, which can be inadequate or conditional, and can never uh, embrace all the aspects of a phenomenon, which, which is a process. He nonetheless uh, gives uh, five points that, that break down uh, imperialist monopoly capitalism. First is the concentration of production and capital has developed to such a high degree that it has led to these monopolies. Second is the merging of banking capital and industrial capital into a new phenomena, which he calls financial capital. And uh, uh, finance capital. And on, on this basis, you have the rise of a financial oligarchy, where a small group of financial institutions and industrial capitalists wield immense power over the economy. <laughs> now those are fused very closely with the state. And in the final analysis, the state defends the interests of their national capitalists, both at home and abroad. Thirdly, you have the export of capital, as distinguished from the export of commodities. And the export of capital becomes increasingly important. And that leads to this international network of dependence on finance capital. Which spreads its net all over the world. In the colonies, through the banks. And of course, the export of capital accelerates the development of capitalism in the countries where it's exported. So fourth, you have the formation of these international monopolist capitalist associations, which basically divide the world up amongst themselves. <laughs> and these cartels or these syndicates or these trusts, they, they start by dividing up the home market and basically have complete control over everything uh, in their own countries. But since the home market is, you know, intimately connected to the world market, you have the fifth element of, of imperialism and uh, monopoly capitalism, which is the territorial division of the planet amongst the biggest capitalist powers. So the old motives of colonial policy are augmented by even more, more activities. You have a struggle for raw materials, for spheres of influence and markets to export your, your goods. And as an example, Lenin says that by, by the year 1900, Nine-tenths of Africa had already been carved up by, and controlled by one imperialist power or another. 
But to understand the world we live in today, I think it's important to take note of, of, uh, of, of another thing he said, which is that the division of the world does not preclude the redivision of the world if the relation of forces changes through, through uneven development, bankruptcy, or, or war. So in short, as Marx explained in the Communist Manifesto, capitalism creates a world in its own image, and this is even more true in the epoch of imperialism. <coughs> But there's a contradiction built into to, to that, uh, which, uh, as, as Lenin says, uh, free competition is the basic feature of capitalism. But monopoly is the exact opposite of free competition. So you end up with ever larger, uh, you know, uh, consolidations of industry of of, of capital. But that process is very contradictory and can, can lead to a lot of different frictions. <coughs> and this is a contradiction that can't be resolved within capitalism itself. And, uh, and so on the one hand, it results in, as he says, immense progress in the socialization of production. In particular, the process of technical invention and improvement becomes socialized. But uh, while you have social production, appropriation remains private. So of course, from our perspective, this is historically progressive in the sense that you know these huge agglomerations of capital and productive capacity, they, they lay the objective material conditions for socialism. <clears throat> to give you an example of the concentration of capital, uh, the, the United States, uh, the U.S. has about 332 million people. And since it's the land of entrepreneurs, there's 38.8 million companies in the United States. <coughs> but just 500 of those companies, the Fortune 500, they account for 66% of the entire GDP. That's an incredible concentration of the means of production. <coughs> And the good news, of course, is that that means there's a lot less for us to have to nationalize uh, after the revolution. It'll be easier to put all of that under workers' control. Uh, and so really, the task of the socialist revolution, one way of thinking of it, is, is as follows. It's to bring production and appropriation into harmony. So instead of private appropriation of wealth that is socially produced, we'll have social appropriation of the wealth that is socially produced. And that's why Lenin said that imperialism is the eve of the social revolution of the proletariat. So those are the, the fundamentals of, of Lenin's position on, imper on imperialism generally. <coughs> and as you'll note, the question of war is only one aspect of it. <coughs> but for the purposes of this discussion, let's look at that aspect in a little more detail. Now, as we saw, when, when World War I started, the Second International collapsed into the, the poisonous swamp of nationalism. Millions of its members were thrown into confusion 
end into the trenches to kill each other. <coughs> As Rob explained, the, the forces of Marxism were reduced to a, a tiny handful. <coughs> now, although Trotsky was formally outside the Bolshevik party at that time, <coughs> he produced a, a really remarkable analysis of these events. And I think it's worth quoting at length from the preface to his book, The War in the International. Which actually became sort of a handbook for the Marxist position on war in the early Soviet Union before the Stalinists, uh, you know, disappeared it. So here's what he said about, the, about what World War I represented. <coughs> The forces of production which capitalism has evolved have outgrown the limits of the nation state. The, na the national state, the present political form, is too narrow for the exploitation of these productive forces. The natural tendency of our economic system, therefore, is to seek to break through the state boundaries. The whole globe, the land and the sea, the surface as well as the interior, has become one economic workshop, the different parts of which are inseparably connected to each other. This work was accomplished by capitalism. But in accomplishing it, the capitalist states were led to struggle for the, subjective of, for the subjection of the world embracing economic system to the profit interests of the bourgeoisie of each country. What the politics of imperialism has demonstrated more than anything is that the old national state has outlived itself and is now an intolerable hindrance to economic development. The present war is at bottom a revolt of the forces of production against the political form of nation and state. <coughs> it's the most colossal breakdown in history of an economic system destroyed by its own inherent contradictions. <coughs> so that's, that, that's an incredible summing up of the economic basis of the war. Of the dead end of capitalism which of course had been foreshadowed in the Communist Manifesto. But as we've seen, Lenin's role in 1914 was even more important. Because he was in charge of politically arming the Bolshevik party. He had to prepare it for the inevitable revolutionary wave that was going to follow the war. <coughs> Now, his main writings for this time were aimed mainly at the, at the core, uh, the, the caters of the party. <laughs> they weren't addressed to the broader masses who could not be reached at that time. So he has some very sharp formulations. <clears throat> As we said this morning, he bent the stick in, a, in, in that direction. <clears throat> he was trying to shake the comrades out of their confusion and their demoralization. And in a series of pamphlets and articles written uh, throughout the war, he applied his usual method of analysis to this question. And one is called Socialism and War. 
It's about socialism and war. Uh, it was published in September 1915, uh, ahead of the Zimmerwald Conference, <coughs> which was this gathering of socialist and anti-war activists in Switzerland. And which, which it's laid, started to lay the basis for a revolutionary opposition to the war. <coughs> and eventually to the establishment of the Communist International. <coughs> now, as, as I have been doing, I'm going to try to use as many of Lenin's own words as possible. <coughs> it is the Lenin year, after all. But, but the main reason is because he was always very careful and precise in his wording. And it's not really possible to improve on that. <coughs> so he starts by stating the basics on this question. Socialists have always condemned war between nations as barbarous and brutal. But our attitude towards war is fundamentally different from that of the bourgeois pacifists. We understand the inevitable connection between wars and the class struggle within the country. We understand that war cannot be abolished unless classes are abolished and socialism is created. We also differ in that we fully regard civil wars, i.e. wars waged by the oppressed class against the oppressing class, slaves against slave owners, serfs against uh, landowners, wage workers against the bourgeoisie. These are legitimate, progressive, and necessary. So again, we're opposed to wars that are reactionary. Those that are intended to deepen the exploitation and oppression of the masses. But the class war is a different kind of a war. So as he says, he who accepts the class struggle cannot fail to accept civil wars which in every class society are natural and, and under certain conditions inevitable continuation, development and intensification of the class struggle. <coughs> this has been confirmed by every great revolution. He then explains that in the, during the epoch of the revolutionary rise of capitalism, There was a whole series of progressive wars. <coughs> For example, the first American Revolution, which he calls a really liberating, really revolutionary war. Of which there have been so few uh, as compared to the vast number of wars of conquest. So the Russian Civil War was another progressive war. <coughs> the defense of the, the young workers state against all these invaders. But World War I was not that kind of a war. So again, it's about the class interests involved, not just about death and killing in the abstract. We don't, we don't, take, a, we don't take a moralistic uh, approach to this. World War I was the first global imperialist war in the true meaning, the full meaning of the word imperialism. It was a new phenomenon and it had to be understood. Now, every war obviously has to be studied concretely. But I would say that Lenin's analysis of the First World War sort of is a baseline for understanding every war that's followed. <coughs> uh, 
As he said, World War I is nothing more nor less than a war between the biggest slave owners for preserving and fortifying slavery. Socialists must take advantage of the struggle between the robbers to overthrow them all. To be able to do this, the socialists must first of all tell the people the truth. To show things as they actually are. Now, of course, they often say that the first casualty of war is the truth. And if you look at Ukraine and Gaza, it's very evident that they are glossing over the reality in order to try to win the population over to their, their position. But we have to explain the truth that the working class has nothing to gain in an inter-imperialist war. <laughs> at most, it results in exchanging one set of oppressors for another. But what are you supposed to do when it's legally impossible to speak the truth? Which was the case in Germany or Russia during World War I. Do you adapt yourself to bourgeois legality? As he says, that's no argument in favor of concealing the truth, but in favor of setting up an illegal organization and press that would be free of police surveillance and censorship. <coughs> so as always, it's about being implacable when it comes to questions of principle and extremely flexible when it comes to tactics. There isn't a one-size-fits-all that, that, that works for every situation. <clears throat> now, one tactic that, that can be used is the, the question of participating in bourgeois parliaments or legislatures. Lenin says, while it is natural for the bourgeoisie to try to hoodwink the people, how should socialists in parliament conduct themselves? <clears throat> As always, Lenin was very direct on this point. Uh, he says, There's two kinds, there are different kinds of parliamentarism. Some utilize the parliamentary arena in order to win the favor of their governments. Others use parliamentarism in order to remain revolutionary to the end. To perform their duty as socialists and internationalists even under the most difficult circumstances. The parliamentary activities of some bring them into ministerial seats. Others are sent to prison, exile, and penal servitude. Some serve the bourgeoisie, others the proletariat. Some are social imperialists, others are revolutionary Marxists. <clears throat> so you tell me what kind of parliamentarians you think people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders are. <clears throat> when it comes to funding the war in Ukraine or historically funding, uh, funding uh, Israel. <clears throat> so Lenin, uh, he, he basically, you know, he, he explained these different policies and said, whoever justifies participation in the present war perpetuates imperialist oppression of nations. Whoever advocates taking advantage of the present embarrassments of the governments to fight for the social revolution champions the real freedom of all nations, which is possible only under socialism. 
Now, I don't have time to go into this into detail, but this question of freedom of all nations is really important. Because the question of imperialism is also deeply connected to the national question. The question of the oppression of one nation by another. As Marx and Engels famously said, no nation can be free if it oppresses other nations. And Lenin was equally implacable. <clears throat> Socialists cannot achieve their great aim without fighting against all oppression of nations. They must, without fail, demand that revolutionaries in oppressing countries should recognize and champion the right of oppressed nations to self-determination, precisely in the political sense of the term, i.e. the right to political secession. The socialist of a ruling or colony-owning nation who fails to champion this right is a chauvinist. But by, by championing this right, far from encouraging the formation of small states, the aim is the creation of, uh, of, of much larger formations. which are more beneficial for the masses and more feel fully in keeping with economic development. <clears throat> the socialists of oppressed nations, for their part, must fight for the complete, including organizational unity of the workers of the oppressed and the oppression nations. <clears throat> The idea of separating one nation from another, so-called cultural national autonomy, is reactionary. So that's Lenin's position on identity politics. But above all, of course, Lenin had to attack these social chauvinists, the, the leaders of the Socialist Party who had betrayed their class. And he, he explained that social chauvinism is basically uh, petty bourgeois opportunism uh, for, uh, when it comes to foreign policy. So just as the, these, uh, these folks are, are for class collaboration at home, they're expressing this class collaboration by supporting their bourgeois in, in their foreign affairs. As Lenin said, not a single Marxist can doubt that opportunism expresses bourgeois policy within the working class movement. Expresses the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and the alliance of a tiny section of bourgeoisified workers with their bourgeoisie against the interests of the proletarian masses the oppressed masses. <clears throat> now in the years leading up to, to the war, the workers' leaders in countries like Germany and France, dur during this period of, of prolonged economic, relatively prolonged economic boom, they rubbed elbows with the working class. And instead of using bourgeois legality and parliamentarism to serve the interests of the, of the working class, they ended up becoming subservient to that, to that bourgeoisie. So again, it's this question of class collaboration, uh, of renouncing revolutionary methods of struggle. Now, this guy Karl Kautsky uh, and his followers were the main architects of this of this betrayal in, 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 in the German social democracy. <clears throat> uh, 
And at one point, Lenin had considered himself a, a Kotskyist. But as soon as Kotsky crossed the class line, he became his mortal political enemy. And he exposed them mercilessly over and over. Because Kautsky still had a lot of influence over a lot of workers. As, as, uh, as Lenin said, by means of obvious sophistry, they rob Marxism of its revolutionary living spirit. They recognize everything in Marxism except revolutionary methods of struggle, the preaching of and preparation for such methods, and the training of the masses precisely in this direction. So basically, these scumbags were arguing the following. That the international is, is just a peacetime instrument. In peacetime, we live like brothers and sisters. But in wartime, we call upon the German workers to exterminate their French brothers and, and vice versa. And that's why Rosa Luxemburg said <coughs> that since August 4th, 1914, German social democracy has been a stinking corpse. And with it, the Second International as a whole. And that's why, as early as 1915, Lenin proclaimed the need for a third international, a communist international. Even though the active forces of revolutionary Marxism were, were reduced to a very small number. <clears throat> it's about the ideas and the principle above all. On the basis of quality, the numbers, the quantity will come. And he quoted a, a French socialist named Paul Gollet. And he said, reformist socialism is dying. Regenerated socialism will be revolutionary, uncompromising, and insurrectionary. And we're, we're, we're seeing that happen today in a place like the United States. Reformist socialism had a little glimmer of a, of a moment. with the DSA and Sanders and all that. But now it's time for revolutionary, uncompromising socialism. Which, of course, is communism. Uh, and so it was in this context that Lenin raised the slogan, convert the imperialist war into civil war. And the meaning of that is that you should convert imperialist war between the nations into war between the classes. And that's why we sometimes say no war but the class war. And because and Lenin really had to push back against that nationalist, chauvinist uh, patriotism. And he, de he developed this policy that's known now as revolutionary defeatism. <clears throat> and again, it, it basically just takes the question of class independence, uh, of class struggle, in both domestic and foreign policy, it takes it to its, its logical conclusion. As he said, during a reactionary war, a revolutionary class cannot but desire the defeat of its own government. <clears throat> so pushing back hard against this idea that you should support your own bourgeoisie, you have to explain to the advanced workers that the best outcome would be the defeat of your own imperialism.
that would be best for the working class as a whole. This didn't mean that Lenin wanted uh, uh, Russia to be occupied by German imperialism. Quite the contrary. The point was to say that the military defeat of Tsarism would lead inevitably to a collapse of the government and the opening of a revolutionary situation. While a victory uh, would only strengthen Tsarism, strengthen reaction, and prolong the hour of revolutionary liberation. So, as he said, the opponents of the defeat slogan are simply afraid of themselves. When they refuse to recognize the inseparable link between revolutionary agitation against the government and helping bring about its defeat. Again, it's not about class collaboration with the enemy imperialism, it's about not class collaborating with your own bourgeoisie. Now again, 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 Lenin was not addressing the broad masses at this time. Obviously, a lot of ordinary Russian uh, workers and peasants and soldiers, they, were, they feared German imperialism. And we, we saw after the war the horrors and brutality of, of what occupation by those, by those armies would mean. So even if they didn't like the Tsar, they didn't like the war generally, they also didn't want that to happen. So Lenin didn't go to the masses and say, you know, you know the defeat of your imperialism is the, is the lesser evil or anything like that. He adapted his slogans and said things like peace, land, bread. Simple things like that, that capitalism and imperialism and czarism could not offer. And that's what mobilized them against the war, coming to the recognition that something fundamental had to change. This is also the context, those, those early months of, of World War I. When Karl Liebknecht, he, in Germany, he produced a secret leaflet that was titled, The Main Enemy is at Home. Now Liebknecht had originally voted for the war credits for the war because he was basically following party discipline and the party said that they should vote for it. But when he realized that he had crossed an even more important line, the class line, he, he, he very bravely stood up against the pressures of the, of, the, of, uh, of the Kaiser and of the imperialist war. And he urged the workers to absorb the lessons of those first months of the war. And he told them, learn everything, don't forget anything. I think that's a great little slogan. That should be our approach to history. Now, already in Christmas, during Christmas of 1914, you had seen fraternization between, between the troops. Have any of you ever seen the movie Joyeux Noël? No. It's from uh, 2005, and it's about that Christmas armistice. They recognized the threat that this represented. But that underlying sentiment towards, towards class solidarity uh, was already there. And so Lenin also takes up the question of pacifism and of disarmament. Uh, 
it's not as bad as it was back in the 60s or 70s, I think, but there's still some people out there that think that the solution to imperialist war is to disarm everybody. Now, Lenin differentiates between that healthy instinct towards pacifism of the masses as, as, compared, as, as opposed to those who use phraseology about pacifism to cover the ambitions of their own bourgeoisie. As he said, the sentiments of the masses in favor of peace often express incipient, incipient protest, anger, and consciousness. of the reactionary character of the war. And it is the duty of all social democrats or communists to utilize those sentiments. But disarmament, to, to focus your energy on this, simply means simply running away from unpleasant reality instead of fighting it. Marxism is not pacifism. It is necessary, of course, to fight for the speediest termination of the war. But only if a revolutionary struggle is called for does the demand for peace acquire proletarian meaning. Without a series of revolutions, So-called democratic peace is a philistine utopia. Now Lenin also didn't pull any punches on the questions of what the workers would have to do to make this a reality. Again, very sharp language aimed at the caters. <clears throat> An oppressed class which does not strive to learn to use arms, to acquire arms, only deserves to be treated like slaves. We cannot, we cannot, unless we have become bourgeois pacifists or opportunists, Forget that we live in a class society from which there is no way out. N nor can there be save through the class struggle. Our slogan must be arming of the proletariat to defeat, expropriate, and disarm the bourgeoisie. We are not in favor of a bourgeois militia, we are in favor of a proletarian militia. We can demand popular election of officers, abolition of all military law, equal rights for foreign and native born workers, with free election of military instructors paid by the state. Under these conditions, only under these conditions, could the proletariat acquire military training for itself and not for the slave owners. And the need for such training is imperatively dictated by the interests of the proletariat. Only after the proletariat has disarmed the bourgeoisie, Will it be able, without betraying its world historic mission, to consign all armaments to the scrap heap? So again, the path to true disarmament is the path through class struggle. It's about class independence in all things at all times. 
Now, this, this uh, approach was basically what Trotsky put together during World War II. It's known as the proletarian military policy. And again, it's a way of harnessing the, the masses, uh, you know, confusions about, about what's going on in a war to further the interests of the socialist revolution and the class struggle. And if you want to learn about a brilliant example of this, our, our comrade Ted Grant, And his comrades in Britain, they carried this out brilliantly during World War II in the early 1940s. Of course, posing the question in these ways, in this way, was in the middle of, uh, of, of a massive war and a, a mass mobilization of the workers and peasants into, into the armies. As always, it's never a question of just copying and pasting, you know, oh, Lenin said this, that's what we have to do today. And I'd say the main thing is to remember that the real power of imperialism is not in its military and all its tanks and jets and, and missiles. But it's in its control of finance capital. Without money, uh, you, you can't wage war. Uh, you, look what's going on in Ukraine right now. Look what's uh, going on with, uh, with Gaza. And so when we talk about the armed masses, we have to remember that the main point is the masses, not the arms. Because first and foremost, we need to win the masses politically. Win them to the idea of a general strike and, and a revolutionary uprising. That's the way you paralyze capitalist society. And you directly pose the question, who really runs society? Now, this is a huge subject. There's been quite a few wars over the last uh, 100 years. I haven't had time to go into any, any real specifics. But I hope to have laid at least a baseline foundation for understanding the Marxist approach to this question. <laughs> Lenin was a, was a brilliant dialectical materialist. But he was also a realist. And he knew that victory wouldn't be easy and it wouldn't be automatic. Even before the end of World War I, the war to end all wars, he said, we do not wish to ignore the sad possibility if, uh, if, if worse comes to worst of mankind going through a second imperialist war if revolution does not come out of the present war in spite of our efforts. Of course, there was a wave of revolutions after World War I. <coughs> and capitalism was ended, but only in one country, in Russia. And due to its material backwardness, due to its uh, prolonged isolation, which flowed from the failure of the socialist revolution to spread to the more advanced countries like Germany, we ended up with the rise of fascism, of Stalinism. And the world did have to go through a second world war that was even bloodier than the first one. War will be with us until capitalism is no longer with us. And so our task is to learn the lessons of Lenin 
And, and, and we can't run away from the, the, the ugly reality that the horrors of capitalism will not be ended without fighting it head on. As, as Lenin put it, think about and reflect on the fierce class struggle and class wars needed to achieve that beautiful future. The Romans used to say, si vis pacem parabellum, which means, if you want peace, prepare for war. And we have to prepare seriously for the class war. It's exciting what's going on around the world right now, but you know, it's only the beginning of that process. So I can't think of a better way to end this than to give Lenin the final word. <laughs> His revolutionary optimism was boundless. And his defiance of world imperialism in words and in deeds was really unmatched. Now when he wrote the following words, in June of 1918, the Russian proletariat was in the midst of a desperate civil war. The forces of counter-revolution surrounded them on all sides. The German army had occupied much of Ukraine. The Japanese had taken Vladivostok. The Czech Legion had proclaimed a government in the Volga. And British troops had just landed in Murmansk. It was literally a question of socialism or barbarism. Of a victory or annihilation. And that's the context in which he proclaimed the following. Let the socialist snivelers croak. Let the bourgeoisie rage and fume. But only people who shut their eyes so as not to see and stuff their ears so as not to hear can fail to notice that all over the world the birth pangs of the old capitalist society which is pregnant with socialism have begun. Our country, which has temporarily been advanced by the march of events to the van of the socialist revolution, is undergoing the particularly severe pains of this first period of travail. But we have every reason to face the future with complete assurance and absolute confidence. We are entitled to be proud and to consider ourselves fortunate that it has come to our lot to be the first to fell in one part of the globe. That wild beast, capitalism, which has drenched the earth in blood, which has reduced humanity to starvation and demoralization, and which will assuredly perish soon, no, ma no matter how monstrous and savage its frenzy in the face of death. So comrades, Lenin lives. Long live Lenin and long live the Revolutionary Communist International.